reached a point where I was extremely apathetic and kind of mentally just checked out. So towards the end of spring semester, I decided to reach out to some of the leaders at New Life and they were extremely helpful trying to help me through with all my doubts and just everything that was happening. We went through over the summer the attributes of God and just really applying that to with everything that happened. And I was able to see it and I was able to get back into pursuing my relationship and then I felt like that really helped me go into this semester being a leader and just really being intentional with other students. After going through what I've gone through, it's given me a new lens to see how people are hurting in different ways. And it's really given me just an open door to have those conversations that are harder to have and to really point it all back to Jesus that this is something that he can help them with because he's helped me with it. And I think it's amazing that I can use something that I thought was so burdensome to point people back to Jesus. Well, welcome. I'm so excited um, to have you guys back. Um, how was your break? You guys have a good break? Yeah. Woo! I had a fantastic break. I'm just so excited. I'm so excited for the new year, the new semester. I really feel like God has a lot of sweet things uh, in store for us this semester. And for me, my break was just great uh, in the sense that Felicia and I got a chance just to spend some time, just some good family time with the kiddos. And one of the things that I really like to do, um, especially with the kids, is to go to the mall. And especially Polaris Mall, because it's like inside, so you're not freezing to death. And they have this killer play area. You guys are probably not, you probably don't think that way. You're probably just like, man, there's like kids all over the place. But for me, I'm like, this is amazing, because I can just throw Zayden in there. And if he's not like trying to escape, he's just like scampering around, like so excited. And I love going there because it provides such hope. And this is why. Because you have all types of different kids there from all types of different backgrounds, different races, different nationalities, different ethnicities. And they just are running around playing together completely just carefree. They, they, don't, they, don't, they don't even notice any difference between, they just see a kid and they're excited about that. And then around kind of the arena are all of their parents. And you have to, and I always think that, that yeah, like maybe these parents aren't like specific enemies. They're not looking across the room thinking, like, they don't know that person. They're not like, her. but there's probably certain prejudices, certain turmoil, certain baggage, certain, a certain background. And here, the, all the parents, I'm thinking that they're probably thinking that in their minds as they're sitting around the circle, as they're watching their kids just completely oblivious to all that. And it's just, it, it just makes me think that I think kids, they, they have an ability to see something more. They have an ability to see beyond. It's, it's interesting where Christ, he says that in order to inherit the kingdom of God, we must become childlike. And when I look at kids, I'm like, man, they just have this innate ability for innocence, to see what we don't see. And we're starting a series uh, today called uh, Rise, and basically we're, we're going to be kind of digging into what does it look like to rise above the fray. Kind of the tagline is pursuing victory in a world of defeat. And really kind of digging into that, like what does that actually look like? How do we get this ability to rise above our situation, to rise above even ourselves? Like, how do we do this? Where does this come from? Where does this start? How do we start? How do we begin to rise above? 
So if you want to flip with me to 2 Kings 6, we're going to be in 2 Kings 6. I'm going to pray for us real quick, and then we'll get uh, kind of into it. Um, Heavenly Father, I just pray, God, I pray that um, you would just get me out of the way, God. Lord, I pray that you would show yourself to be victorious in this room, in our hearts, on this campus, in this city, in our country, in this world. God, I pray that we would be able to tap into that, that we would be able to come into your presence today, God, that we would um, be able to uh, be intimate with you today. God, I, I pray that we would, um, that our eyes would just be open to who you are and what you're doing. And I just pray this in your name. Amen. All right. So we're in 2 Kings 6. And this passage in 2 Kings 6 is amazing. It's just been obliterating me the entire, the entire break. It's been just awesome. All right, so 2 Kings 6, 24. Sometime later... Benadad, king of Aram, mobilized his entire army and marched up and laid siege to Samaria. There was a great famine in the city. The siege lasted so long that a donkey's head sold for 80 shekels of silver and a quarter of a cab of seed pods for five shekels. Okay, first off, the first point in your bulletin is we are surrounded by a lot of bad news. We are surrounded by a lot of bad news. Let me give you a context for this passage. You have King David, you have King Solomon, um, that was a consolidated Israel. Then the kingdom splits up. You've got this northern kingdom called Israel, this southern kingdom called Judah. And here we're talking about the northern, the northern <coughs> kingdom of Israel, and they have this capital called Samaria. Now they obviously have different enemies in Judah, and some of their enemies, and one of their enemies is Aram, the Aramaeans. And the Aramaeans are basically present-day Syria. Their capital is in Damascus. So, you know, all these different all these different tribes or nations are kind of, you know, trying to take over land, trying to gain influence, and that's what's happening here. We have the king of Aram. He is going and sieging the city of Samaria. Now, if you don't really understand what that means, it basically means that the armies are surrounding the city, and they're not letting anyone go out, and they're not letting anything come in. Which is a problem, because if you're not getting any food in, you end up just starving. You don't have, there's, there's no food that's able to come in. And so what's happening is there's this incredible inflation that's happening. First off, we have this donkey. We have a donkey's head. A donkey's head is going for 80 shekels. That's like 50 bones for a donkey's head. Now, you, know, you just might think, well, it's just a donkey's head, okay. But a donkey, like, that was unclean for the Israelites to eat. So it shows their desperation that, one, they are willing to go and eat a donkey, but also they're eating the head, which is, like, the worst part of the body. So it's, like, the worst meat, but yet it's incredibly expensive. Then we have these seed pods. And you're like, what is the seed pod? Some of your scriptures may also say dove's dumb, um, which is kind of, you're like, that's funny, dove's dumb. But this is what is happening. The, the birds are pooping. People are gathering that poop together, and they're sifting these seeds out of this poop. And then they're going and they're selling it for this high price. Like, literally, there's no food coming in except for what the birds are dropping. Like, that is the state of desperation in this city at that time. Then let's continue. Verse 26, as the king of Israel was passing by on the wall, a woman cried to him, help me, my lord the king. The king replied, if the lord does not help you, where can I get help for you? From the threshing floor, from the wine press? Then he asked her, what's the matter? He basically is like, how can I help you? You know, what, what can I do? I can't just go and like make it rain food. Like I can't just you know, there isn't just like a wine press here that I can get food, like poof, like magically. How can I really help you? And she says, she answered, this woman, this woman said to me, give up your son so I may eat him today. And tomorrow we'll eat my son. So we cooked my son and ate him. The next day I said to, him, to her, give up your son so we may eat him. But she had hidden him. When the king heard the woman's words, he tore his robes. 
As he went along the wall, the people looked, and there underneath he had sackcloth on his body. Does anybody else read this? And just like, this is messed up. Like, there's just some passages in Scripture that are just grotesque, just graphic, just messed up. Like, this, this woman is, there, she's giving up her, there, these two women made a pact. She's giving up her child. They're, they killed it. They, they're eating it. And then the other one's supposed to do the same, like cannibalism. What is going on here? This is ridiculous. This is crazy. It just, it's just like it just goes to show that in this city, this is just like hell on earth. Just, just hell on earth at this point. Felicia, uh, my wife, she um, posted this um, video on Facebook right before uh, Christmas, and it was kind of this news um, video about what was happening in Aleppo. And if you don't know what Aleppo is, um, Aleppo basically is a city that holds kind of like, you know, the rebel army or one of the main rebel forces. They kind of are encamped in Aleppo in Syria. And you have like the Assad government with the Russians and they're trying to destroy the rebels. So basically their government, the Assad government, go, they went and they're just bom like bombing, just destroying, just eviscerating this entire city from top to bottom. And there's civilians in there, still in there. And this article, or this, this, this video, when it's showing this devastation, and it showed, um, it was at the hospital, and it was showing how um, this building had been destroyed, and then it collapsed on itself. And there's this woman there who, she's like bloody, she's hysterical, and she, and basically she's, she's lost both of her kids, like her kind of older adult kids, and she is the only adult out of, Three families that have survived this bombing. The only adult. And then there's this child next to her. And, and the child's about the, the, the age of Zayden. And he's not crying. He's got debris on his face, dust on his face. Just completely shell-shocked. Like lost both of his parents. Like no idea what's going on. And there's another, another young, a young man, a teenager comes in and he's carrying this, this baby and he's crying and he's just like weeping and he's carrying this child like a, like a proud dad but he's not old enough to be a dad and this child's in his arms and this child is his one month baby brother. Lifeless baby brother. And then there's two other kids that walk in, and they had left their father in the rubble, and they're looking for their mom, and they go and they sit on this bench, and they're just going to sit on this bench and wait for their mom, if she ever comes. Just hell on earth. Complete devastation. Destruction. Despair. Hopelessness. Defeat. Just this kind of like, man, how are we ever going to get past this? How are we ever going to get out of this? And I don't know about you guys, but I feel like there's this palpable feeling in 2016 this, this, of, of kind of like, what in the world is going on in our world? Am I the only one? Because I, I felt like what, like the, the New Year's Eve programs that we were, we were watching, that was basically the, the resonating point. It's just like, man, 2016 sucks. Let's just get in, into 2017. There's a lot of bad news in 2016. Let's just get into 2017. I mean, we had the divisiveness of an election. Either side, just this divisiveness. We had racial unrest. We had Europe is on the brink of collapse. We have these terrorist attacks, not only over in Europe, but here in our own backyard. The poverty, hopelessness, just this bad news. And maybe it, it, it raises these questions of like, God, have you, have you taken your hand off of the, all of this? Are you still involved? Like, have you, have you left this world? Have you left this country? Have you left this campus? And that is, that's the, the mindset that the people in Samaria are in at this point, just complete hopelessness. 
And, and so we have this, the king, he's tearing his clothes, he's in grief, he's in mourning, and he goes to Elisha, the prophet. And Elisha, it's either Elisha or Elisha, I'm going to say Elisha, and Elisha is kind of like the prophet after Elijah. So we have Elisha, and he's going to Elisha, and this is what he says in verse 33. He says, this disaster is from the Lord. Why should I wait for the Lord any longer? So the king is basically like, why should I wait on the Lord? Like, why should I expect anything from God? What is God going to do? And then Elisha says, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord says. About this time tomorrow, a seah of flour will sell for a shekel, and two seahs of barley for a shekel at the gate of Samaria. So Elisha basically is saying, tomorrow there's going to be some real food. Like some real food is coming in. Not like a donkey's head, not these seed pods, some real food. But not just real food, like an abundance of food. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to lower this inflation, it's going to lower these prices. And man, this flour, there's going to be tons of flour sold for a really cheap price. And then we have this officer in verse 2. The officer on whose arm the king was leaning said to Elisha, the man of God, Look, even if the Lord should open the floodgates of the heavens, could this happen? He's basically saying, how can this be? Like, even if God, like, rained down food, even if the floodgates of heaven are coming down, is it even going to be enough? They're asking, is it, is it even possible? This officer is looking around at everything, and he's asking himself, like, man, is, how is God even going to do anything? Like, I see what I see, and there's no way. This, this, this feeling of doubt and disbelief, which has led to a culture of defeat in him. Like, he absolutely just doesn't think that this is possible. But here, Elisha is just like, no, man, like, you will see it with your own eyes, but you will not eat of any of it. Like, Elisha is saying, no, there, like, you have to trust this promise. There is going to be, man, it's, it's just, just going to be an abundance. And the second point, the number two, is that we struggle to believe in God's promises. We struggle to believe in God's promises. I think if we look at our situation, not only do we not believe that God isn't able to provide a way out, but that these promises seem impossible to us. Like, have you ever felt like that? Like, have you ever felt like the life that God wants you to live seems unattainable? Like, have you ever felt like, man, you're just stuck in this never-ending cycle of brokenness? And, and man, whenever there's a, a possibility for relief, you're just dragged right back into the gutter. You know, whether it's by outside forces or whether it's by your own sin. And you end up asking God these questions. You end up asking, God, are you able to change this? Are you able to change us? Are you able to change me? Like, I don't know about you guys, but I know that this can be true of me. I know that this is true of me. I am my own worst enemy. Like, I am uh, easily discouraged. I'm a natural pessimist. I'm a natural defeatist. I'm a natural uh, half-glass empty type person. That's just my personality. That's just who I am. But it leads me into the gutter. It leads me into this despair and into this doubt and disbelief. And then I don't think you have to be a pessimist like me to be stuck in a culture of defeat. Like you might have moments of hope. You might have those moments of sunshine. You might hear this message today and be like, man, this is great. This is awesome. You know, tomorrow you might have a great day. But then tomorrow you have struggle. You have difficulty. You have a setback. And you just feel this sense of man. Not a great day, but just this defeat, this culture of defeat. We miss out on the promises of God. 
There's this um, book I read, and I love, I love breaks because it gives me a chance to read. And um, this book uh, is by a guy named Henry Blackaby, who wrote Experiencing God. Has anybody read it? It is supposed to be incredible. I have it, but I've never read it. But I read his other book called Flickering Lamps, and it's so good. Um, this guy, he is a pastor. He is a pastor of this very healthy church in California, and he got called to go to the middle of Saskatchewan. Yes, Canada, way up there in the middle of the cold, bitter cold. He got called up there to take his family, him and like four kiddos, one on the way, to go up to Saskatchewan to basically revive this church of five people. That five people, this dilapidated building, half the five didn't even want him to come. Half the five were like, just disband this thing and get it done and over with. Like, why is this clown coming up here trying to revive us? Like, we've got five people. But he came up there, like, without really any salary at all. And, and, and what he noticed is that there was just such a sense, just a, just a culture of defeat within the people. Like, the people, they had stopped believing in the power of God. They had stopped believing in the impossible. And these are a couple of quotes from this book. He, said, he says that God was just as powerful in our midst as he was in the largest church in the world. We knew it and behaved like it, and that made all the difference. God was just as powerful in our midst as he was in the largest church in the world. We knew it and behaved like it, and that made all the difference. You have to know that he loves your church as much as he has loved any church in history. And I think this goes for both church and individual. He loves us just as, as much as he has loved anybody in history. He loves this body right here just as much as he has loved any church in the history of the church. He said, some people have said to me, well, Henry, you're an optimist, but I'm a realist. What they were trying to say was that I am naively positive, and they are the ones who see the harsh reality of the circumstances. But can I tell you something? There is nothing more real than Christ's presence in his church. That every observation, critique, opinion must be viewed in light of this. But there is nothing more real than Christ's presence in his church. They started believing this. And I think we have to believe this, not only as people, but as a church, that whether we have a church of four or 40 or 400 or 400,000, that God's power and God's presence is at work in us just as much as the smallest church or the largest church. Just as much as someone with the smallest of gifts and someone with the greatest of gifts. God's power is and presence is manifest in the same way. That's available to us. And this church started to believe. This culture of defeat in the people and in the church started being converted into this culture of victory. And they started to grow. There's actually a college in that city, in that town, and college students started getting connected. And this church started becoming, they, they started this uh, pastoral training college and this tiny church, he never said that this church became a mega church. He never said that it went over even 100. There's no indication of that in the book. It sounded like it was around 60 to 70, maybe 100 max. And it, this tiny little church ended up planting 38 churches in different areas. One church, tiny church, about the size of our church, planted 38 churches. Now, when I see that, I see it, man, it's possible. It's possible. If we would believe, if we would grasp onto the, the presence of God, if we would know that God is just as powerful here as he is in any other place, they realize that God hadn't left them, that God was right there the entire time. That he was present with them. The third point in your bulletin is that it's not about being an optimist, but about being an opportunist. What I'm not saying is, man, let's just have some really like lovely, good, good like thoughts and feelings, and that's it. 
It's not about being an optimist, or about being an optimist, but about being an opportunist. Let's continue in the passage. 2 Kings 7, verse 3. Now there were four men with leprosy at the entrance of the city gate. They said to each other, why stay here until we die? If we say we'll go to the city, the famine is there, and we will die. If we stay here, we will die. So let's go over to the camp of the Arameans and surrender. If they spare us, we live. If they kill us, then we die. So we've got these four dudes who have leprosy. Now basically they're unclean, they're outcasts, they're outside the city. They've been rejected by their people. But not only that, they've been abandoned and forgotten. So if the people inside the city aren't getting food, these guys especially aren't getting food. So they're looking at their predicament saying, well, if we stay here, we don't have any food, we'll starve and we'll die. If we go into the city, there's no food in the city. So if we go into the city, we'll just starve and die. So why don't we just go to the Arameans? Why don't we just go to their camp? Because maybe, you know, if we go there and they kill us, then... You know, we didn't really lose anything in the crowd. Like, we're going to die here, we're going to die there, we might as well go, and if we get, we get killed, we get killed. But maybe they'll spare us. This glimmer of hope, this glimmer of opportunity, this possibility. Like, man, let's, let's go and see, let's see what happens here. So in verse 5, at dusk they got up and they went to the camp of the Aramaeans. When they reached the edge of the camp, not a man was there. The Lord had caused the Arameans to hear the sound of chariots and horses and a great army, so that they said to one another, Look, the king of Israel has hired the Hittite and Egyptian kings to attack us. So they got up and fled in the dusk and abandoned their tents and their horses and donkeys. They left the camp as it was and ran for their lives. So they come into this camp. No one's there. Like God has intervened. The miraculous has happened. I mean, the Arameans are sitting there and they hear this loud noise. There's no armies coming, but they think that these armies are coming and they just like, they're out of there. They leave everything behind. God is providing a way out for them. And it reminds me of this story uh, literally within uh, the chapter right before. It's in 2 Kings uh, 6.13. And basically in 2 Kings 13, you have um, the king of Aram, he's ticked off at Elisha because Elisha basically said this bad stuff about him. And so the king goes after him and surrounds his city. So in verse 15, when the servant of the man of God, as in the servant of Elisha, got up and went out early the next morning, an army with horses and chariots had surrounded the city. Oh Lord, oh my Lord, what shall we do? The servant asked. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered, Elisha answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord, open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked and saw the hills full of horses and chariots of fire all around Elisha. So we have, this, I mean, this story is incredible, too. That's why I had to use it. I mean, we have Elisha here. He's surrounded by the armies, kind of like the siege, just you know, just in the chapter that we're in. And the servant is like, "Dude, we're gonna die! Like they're gonna they're gonna take us. We're surrounded. The king's ticked off. They're gonna come. They're gonna get us." And Elisha's like, "Man, open your eyes! Like look who's got your back! Like see beyond. See into the beyond." And then he finally sees the spiritual nature. He sees beyond just this physical, just the material. The, the officer of the king in uh, 2 Kings 7 was doing the exact same thing. He was seeing just the physical. And Elisha's like, see beyond that physical. And it's just armies. Armies, God's armies, chariots, chariots of fire. It's interesting, I, I read this quote. This quote said that Elisha didn't pray that God would change anything, but that their eyes would see the reality of the situation. The perceived lack, lack of perception of the servant didn't make the spiritual reality any less real. Faith is never imagining 
of un, is never the imagining of unreal things. It is the grip of things which cannot be demonstrated to the senses, but which are real. The chariots of fire were actually there. It's like, man, are we seeing what God is doing? Are we seeing the beyond? That's your next point, is that we must see the beyond. We need to see what's beyond. Uh, in my junior year of college, I connected to this homeless man um, named Ronnie, and I was trying to kind of help him get his life together and situated, and uh, so I kind of was helping him get like rent and everything like that, and so he took me down uh, High Street to Fifth, because that's kind of where he was going to get this apartment, and he grew up in Short North. Like, when he grew up in Short North, Short North was one of the roughest neighborhoods in the entire city. Like, and then it got gentrified, and then even when we were walking down, it wasn't fully gentrified like it is even now. It was still pretty rough. And so he's, we're walking down High Street, right by Fifth, we're looking at the arches with all the lights if you've been down to Short North, and he's, and he's like, if I could tell the world one thing, and here's a guy who's probably never going to tell the world, you know, never had that megaphone to tell the world something, and he's like, if I could tell the world, if I could say one thing, this is what I would say. We need to see beyond the lights. We need to see beyond the lights. What a profound thing to say. And I'm like, what? What do you mean by that? And basically, I think what Ronnie was, was saying is that we need to see what's beyond. We need to see that there's something more than just this. Like, we need to see the transcendent beyond. We need to see the spiritual realm. We need to see the more than just the surface of things. We need to see more than just that there's things that are just more than what we can actually see. There's another quote by um, Blackbee, by Henry Blackbee, and he says, if churches or if people would open their spiritual eyes to see the immensity of God's power that is fully available to them, we would experience revival in our day. If our eyes would be open to what God is doing, to the spiritual realities of what God, God is doing, there would be spiritual revival in our day, in our lives, in our church, on our campus, in our world. We have to see what's beyond. We have to see what God has done, how he has already provided. But the question for us is, are our eyes open? Are we blind to what he is doing? Are we seeing the beyond? The reality is that he's already provided everything that we need. He's already provided Christ. Like, he's already provided victory. Like, victory has been, has been had. Death, sin has been defeated. Victory is here, in our midst right now. Right here. Like, he has given us the Holy Spirit in order to bask in this victory. To be in tune with what he is doing. He's provided the hope. He's provided the abundance of life. Like, we've been given the spoils. We are just like the lepers. We are coming into his spoils. If we continue in this passage in verse 8 in the 2 Kings 7, the men who had leprosy reached the edge of the camp and entered one of the tents. They ate and drank and carried away silver, gold, and clothes and went off and hid them. They returned and entered another tent and took some things from it and hid them also. I mean, you have to imagine, these guys, this is more than they have ever seen in their life. They've never been exposed to such abundance. This is more than they've ever imagined. And they're eating, and they're drinking, and they're celebrating. They're enjoying the spoils. Do you believe that this is available for us? That Christ has given us an opportunity to come into this type of of abundance. <coughs> now what I'm not saying, what I'm not saying is I'm not saying health, wealth, and prosperity. What I'm not saying is 
you know, God's just going to give you this, this long life. He's going to give you everything that you ever you know, could want. He's not going to, you know, create a, give you a life that doesn't have any problems. It's just going to be smooth sailing. That's not what I'm saying. And I don't even think that's what the passage is alluding to. But what if we could get, what if we could tap into, you know, the spiritual life that we always dreamed of? That is available to us. The spiritual life that we've always dreamed of, that's accessible because of the Holy Spirit through Christ. This abundant, robust, spiritual life that he has provided a way out for us, a way out of defeat, a way out of despair, a way out of our sin, and that he has given us hope and life. He wants to use you for his purposes. Like the lepers are enjoying this incredible spoils, and then they realize, like, holy smokes, like we can't just enjoy the spoils and not tell anybody about it because there are, you know, thousands of people who are struggling right now. Like they're dying right now. They're eating their own young right now. Like we can't just sit on the spoils and not tell anybody about it and just enjoy it ourselves and not draw anybody into that. So in verse 9, this is what they say. They say, then they said to each other, we're not doing right. This is a day of good news. And we are keeping it to ourselves. If we wait until daylight, punishment will overtake us. Let's go at once and report this to the royal palace. So they went and called out to the city of gatekeepers and told them, we went into the Aramean camp and not a man was there. Not a sound of anyone. Only tethered horses and donkeys and the tents left just as they were. The gatekeeper shouted the news and it was reported within the palace. So they go, they tell the gatekeepers, it gets, it get, the word gets to the palace. The king basically sends out a group of people to go and check and see if this is legit. Then those people find out, yeah, this is actually legit. Like there's just all this equipment and clothes and spoils just scattered for miles as the army is kind of like hightailing it out of there. And then in verse 16, the people get word of it. The people went out and plundered the camp of the Aramaeans. So a sale of flour sold for a shekel, and two sales of barley sold for a shekel, as the Lord had said. Now the king had put the officer on whose arm he leaned in charge of the gate, and the people trampled him in the gateway. And he died, just as the man of God had foretold, when the king came down to his house. So if salvation comes to the sea, you know, the people are just, they're coming into this abundance. They're coming into the spoils. But then we have this officer. And this officer never experienced it. And he never experienced it because of his disbelief. And it actually, it ends up killing him. It ends up separating him. He never comes into that's the spoil. And I think we can all have these self-fulfilling prophecies. Like, what do we tell ourselves about God? What do we tell ourselves about how God sees us? Is it words of victory or is it defeat? Like, our words actually have power. Like in 2 Corinthians um, 10, 5, um, Paul says we take every, we take captive every thought and make it obedient to Christ. But every thought, every word that comes into your brain, literally what that's meaning, what I imagine is like we're taking it to Christ. We're taking it to his, his throne and basically asking him, is what, is what I'm thinking, is this true? Is this real? Does this belong in your throne room? And if it doesn't belong, he's like, get that out of my throne room. It doesn't belong here. It's not true. Taking every thought captive, making it obedient to the gospel, making it obedient to the message of Christ. Then in Romans 12, 2, do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is is good and pleasing and perfect will. 
And it's this idea of renewing our minds, repatterning our minds, to see ourselves in light of how Christ sees us, to see ourselves in light of being his kids, the children of God, to see ourselves in light that the God of the universe has decided to put himself in us, in mankind. That that presence and that power is available to us and lives in us. We have to remind ourselves this over and over and meditate on this. Repatterning our thoughts. My New Year's resolution is to be more positive. And it's not just like positive thinking. Like, man, you think good thoughts and good things are going to happen. That's what you find on certain talk shows or things like that. You know, just like, man, just think good things. Life's going to be great. I'm not saying that. I'm saying, we, you know, as believers, we get a chance to tap into the power of God. We get to tap into the Holy Spirit. We get to um, embrace and be completely engulfed in the reality of the gospel. We get to tap into that. Your last point is that if God has provided for my greatest need, which is eternal separation from Him, which is the cross, if God has provided for my greatest need through the cross, then I can trust Him to provide for my simplest need. That goes for all of us. If God has provided for our greatest need through Jesus, through the cross, then we can trust him to provide for our simplest needs. Man, are our eyes open to that? God, what are you doing? How are you taking care of us? How are you providing for us? Like, I believe that that, that God has um, prepared the way for us. I believe that God has already provided people on this campus who are hungry, who are ready, who are open to hearing the message of Christ. And it's just a matter of us connecting with Him and just a matter of us sharing the abundance of Christ, sharing the spoils of the gospel with them, sharing Christ with them. Like, I believe that there are people right now on this campus who God has been preparing for years, months, maybe even just today, for conversations, for us to, to intersect, for a miraculous moment to happen in their life. Will we come into that, or will we remain in disbelief like the officer? I just don't want us to miss it. I'll just end with one last story. Um, Felicia, over this break, you know, she kind of hit a low point. She kind of was at a point where she's like, man, should I even continue doing the chain? Or should I just give up? And it's really at the end of her rope. If you don't understand, Felicia and I have been living a, an unsustainable lifestyle. <laughs> We've got two kids that we literally are passing back and forth like a baton, and then we run basically two nonprofits, and we run them from our home, from our basement. And that doesn't give us a lot of, you know, undistracted, clear-minded time to actually do the things that we need to do. And that can really wear you down when you're just kind of handing your kids back and forth, and you're kind of like, here's two hours, and it's like, the ringer dings, and you're like, oh crap, I can still have stuff to do. And that's the mode, that's, the, that's, that's how we've been living, that's how we've been surviving the last couple of years. And she's just like, I'm, I'm at the end of it right now. And she literally, she's praying, she's like, God, like, I don't know what to do. And she's like, God, just show me your glory. Show me who you are, what are you doing? So she just goes online, and she like Googles, um, you know, co-working spaces. Because she heard of a co-working space in Worthington. She's just like trying to, trying to find this co-working space. And she finds this random space in, in the middle of Worthington, which is like five minutes from her house. And she calls it up, calls the number, and she doesn't get like the receptionist, which she should have. She got like the actual owner of the space. 
Like, he picked up because he was on a trip and he was bored. He was like, oh, just pick up my phone because I'm bored. So he picks up, picks up the phone and she's like, man, I saw your co-working space. And she kind of talked about what Unchained does and how they fight human trafficking and all this stuff. And, and, he's, and he's like, okay, what can you do? Now his co-working space is like $700 a month. That's what the actual amount is. And he's like, what can you do? She's like, 150 He's like, all right. Meet me in my office in two days. We'll sign the papers. Do you, do you understand that? $150 for this incredible co-working space where she has her own desk and everything. It's where different social entrepreneurs are. Like a football player, Anthony Schlegel, is like next door and in her desk next door, which is really cool. Like all these different social entrepreneurs. This guy is a believer, and he created this co-working space in order to get his hands into the community. But he also runs a bubble tea place right next door, and a fitness center, and Felicia's able, she gets, she gets free fitness. Can you believe, are you guys understanding what I'm saying here? Like, here, she's at the end of her rope, we're at the end of our rope. She gets this incredible co-working space where she is no longer has to work out of our basement. And um, we have Kate Poston, who's going to go and babysit for us, which is a shout out to her, which is incredible. So Kate's going to watch the kids for a couple days so she can get out of the house, do her job, and she has a fitness center. That was right after she literally prayed, God, show me your glory. Let me see what you're doing. Do you not understand how good God is? That God not, not only is like, I want to meet your needs, but I want to give you abundant life. He does the same for us, both physically and spiritually. He's like, okay, man, I know your need, and I want to meet your need, and I already did it with Jesus and man, if you would just understand that right there and, and marinate that on that right there and let that change your life and transform your life, man, you'd have abundant lives that you cannot even imagine. And you come into spoils like these lepers that you've never experienced before. And Felicia and I, just in this one little thing, we are already experiencing just, just so much more healthiness within our marriage, within our family, within our house. We didn't do anything. We didn't create space. We didn't do anything to deserve that. God is just so good. The question for us is, is are our eyes open to this? Are our eyes open to what he is doing? To how his presence is right here in our body. He hasn't left our body, but he is right here in you. Not in someone else, in you. Are our eyes open to that? Are our hearts ready to receive that, ready to embrace that, ready to embrace a culture of victory, not a culture of defeat? I'm tired of a culture of defeat in my own life. And I won't stand for it anymore because Christ doesn't stand for it. And I don't, I'm not going to stand for it for any of us either. Because that's not what Christ has called us to, and that's not who we are called to. So I'm just going to, that's where we're going this semester, if you don't know. And I'm just going to pray for us, and, and I just hope that some of this resonated with you. And, and my challenge to you is to stew on that. Like, are you living in a culture of defeat? Are you living in a culture of victory? Are your eyes open to what God is doing? And maybe that's just the prayer over and over and over this next week, or maybe even this entire semester, is God, I don't want to be blind anymore. I want to see you. And that's my prayer for us. So Heavenly Father, God, I just pray that um, you would manifest this in our life, God. I pray, God, that we would see you that we would know you, that we would embrace you with everything that we've got. God, I know, I'm admitting to you right now that I sin and that I have, have not believed in your promises, that I am more like the servant than I am like the prophet. That is, that is for sure. God, that I'm like, man, what are you going to do? 
how are you gonna how are you gonna do this? And God, I just I beg you that I would see the beyond, that I would see the armies, the chariots of fire. That I would see that you have already gone ahead of us. That you have already prepared the way. It's just a matter of me just getting getting myself out of the way and just coming into that. God, I pray that you would change our hearts because you are not only willing to change our hearts, but you are able to change our hearts. And I declare that for us, God, that we don't have to walk around with our heads down anymore. But we can hold our heads up high as as. as Believers, as, as this entire church, that we can hold our heads up high because we know that your presence is in here, whether there's four or 40 or 400 or 4,000. <clears throat> and God, I just pray that you would explode in our hearts as we come in contact with you. Transform us, God.